Good morning, everyone. My name is Sharon Folks Abrahams. I'm a lecturer at uh, the University of the West Indies Law Faculty, Mona. And we're just waiting for some others to come on board. Before we start, we have about uh, another two minutes before 9.30. So welcome again. And uh, we'll just wait until some others join on before we begin. I just want to say thank you to the Dean, Dean Shazida Ali for putting this all together for us. So far we started on Friday evening uh, with a class of 73, uh, which is the first class for the law faculty of 50 years. And so we just want to celebrate, we want to congratulate, and we also want to elevate everyone who is here because we are moving on to greater things. Thank you very much, Dean, for all you have done for the faculty and for those who previously to you have also kept uh, the Mona uh, flag flying high. So uh, we're grateful to all the professors. Professor Codellini, you've been there for quite a number of years yourself. And so we have built something that I think we can all be, be very proud of. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharon. So it's 9.30. So we're going to begin our session this morning. And we welcome everyone again to the University of the West Indies Faculty of Law, seventh annual symposium on law, governance mm -hmm. and society. This year we celebrate 50 years of existence. And the theme this year is celebrating and surviving UW, UWI law 50 and beyond. As our pro vice chancellor, Professor Dale Weber has said in his address to us, and I quote, our present reality is one of great upheaval due mainly to the advent of COVID-19 pandemic. We would be hard pressed to think of any aspect of our lives that has been untouched by this 21st century challenge. Very quickly, we have had to reimagine anew. The topics that we will be explored in this symposium, legal profession and judicial ethics, the law of the sea, sports law and tourism and the law, are all areas that will be critical to our continued survival. And for that reason, we have assembled an August panel here. We have uh, Mr. Donovan White, who is the Director of Tourism for the Jamaica Tourist Board. We have Professor Gilbert Codellini, who is an Emeritus Professor of Law at the University of the West Indies. We have Ms. Helen Liu, who is a member of Myers, Fletcher and Gordon, and who will deal with the question of environmental law. And Mrs. Carla and Harris Roper, who is also a UWI law graduate and attorney at law, and she will present to us on the challenges of labor law. So I'm pleased to have as our first presenter, Mr. Donovan White, who is the Director of Tourism on the Jamaica Tourist Board, with over 20 years experience as a senior executive in marketing and business development, a strategist and business leader. He is responsible for promoting and further enhancing Jamaica's reputation as the premier destination in the global marketplace. He's keen on leveraging existing industry relationships with investors, hoteliers, visitors, and key stakeholders to help the JTB embrace the new global paradigm shifts in tourism. 
He serves on several public and private sector boards, including the School of Computing and Information Technology at the University of Technology. The current chairman of the Consumer Affairs Commission, he's also a member of the board of directors at the Tourism Enhancement Fund and the Tourism Linkages Network. An avid sportsman, Donovan White is the professional football Jamaica limited director and president of the Waterhouse Football Club. Welcome and thank you for coming to us. I present to you, Mr. Donovan White. Please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Madam Chair, thank you so very much um, uh, for that very, very um, good welcome that I'm not sure I deserve the, the, um, the, the enthusiasm that you put into it, but I will take it anyways. Professor Gilbert Codellini, Professor, Professor Emeritus at UWI, an attorney at law. Uh, Mrs. Carla Ann Harris Roper, Principal Consultant of the Employment Matters Caribbean Jamaica. And Ms. Helen Liu, Attorney at Law, Miles Fletcher and Gordon. Greetings to my esteemed, esteemed panelists and a happy Sunday to who have taken the time to join us here for this extremely interesting um, subject matter, but as well um, this very well needed symposium um, that I know for the last several days you have stirred lots of conversations and um, caused uh, lots of thinking um, that is well needed uh, across our space. To say that 2020 has ha as, uh, was hard is an understatement, really. And, you know, in many ways, it was, it was as I have experienced it, brutal is the word I'd probably coin to, to, to describe what 2020 has been. Uh, the world has changed in many ways. Uh, we never uh, imagined and our return to normalcy has taken far longer than most believed um, or may have even imagined themselves. The way we do business, the parameters of our engagement have had to be revisited. Um, and in some instances, change completely. Additionally, new paradigms have been activated to navigate these changing times. No industry has been spared and the travel and tourist industry has been significantly impacted and is still being impacted, not only in Jamaica, but right across the region. This brings to the four mechanisms that were required to guide the execution of and relationships with partners, stakeholders, both internal and external. The primary focus, <clears throat> excuse me, of the sector um, currently is really about positioning, or dare I say, repositioning the destination for recovery. As international borders reopen and vaccination programs are rolled in, we have seen the resumption of travel and a very optimistic, and is very optimistic really, of our sector um, as being well on the road to recovery. This, of course, against the background that for four years leading up to 2020, Jamaica had annual growth rates of more than 6% in tourism arrivals and an average of about 9% direct contribution to GDP. When you take into consideration the indirect or linkages of the tourism sector, the real GDP contribution accounted for an average of about 34% in those years. However, uh, we are acutely mindful of the changes brought about by these pandemic. Changes in the transportation sector, for example, airlift restoration, um, cruise shipping restoration, ground transportation, uh, which is a big part of the the linkages industry um, in the tourism space. Visitor arrival trends are also changing. The, for example, the demographic profile of, of the, the travelers today um, as against three or four years ago um, has begun to, to, to seed uh, changes that we are in fact beginning to see in the destination. Safety and security of employees and visitors in resort areas um, has also changed and is changing. 
And then there's a heightened exposure of the destination um, to, to, to litigation um, for, from, from because of many of these changes. The strength of Brand Jamaica has served us well over the years, generating value to our stakeholders, which includes the government and the people of Jamaica. Uh, looking ahead, we need to further position the resources of the board to exploit this intrinsic value so it remains relevant and continues to build a sustainable industry. There is a legal framework within the business environment and the industry, locally and international, that has in the past presented challenges and no doubt will continue to do so as we look ahead to the post-pandemic presumption, full resumption of travel. And I'll cover four, five, four or five of these areas that I believe um, may spur some conversation amongst your, your, yourselves um, and help us to guide our legal steps in terms of how we go forward. When our local borders reopened to visit, a to visit arrivals, all operational protocols were executed under the ambit of the Disaster Risk Management Act. As an important legislation to regulate activities which govern how we operate during a natural disaster of which the pandemic is. The legislation provides a framework which empowers the government to contain movement of citizens and visitors, thereby restricting the spread of the virus and or in the case of a natural disaster, deepening the impact of the disaster. Through this tourism, through, through this, the birth of the Tourism Resilient Corridor happened, which was created for visitors in our resort areas along the coastlines um, of the island, which have, to be fair, been extremely successful in safely reopening the sector uh, with less than a 1% positivity rate of COVID-19 for visitors within the corridor. The second is the control entry program, which we call the travel authorization platform. This platform was created for the re-entry initially of Jamaicans to, to Jamaica um, that were um, curtailed in faraway places um, at the start of the pandemic. As we sought to reopen tourism, uh, we decided to expand the travel authorization platform to accommodate the control entry of visitors as well as as well um, and was subsequently hosted by the marketing website of the Jamaica Tourist Board. Of course, this was done independent of but in collaboration with the Passport Immigration and Citizens Authority, which is PICA and the Ministry of National um, Security. So there you had um, Two, 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 um, two government ministries, the Ministry of National Security, the Ministry of Tourism, working with two um, uh, public body agencies, which is the Jamaica Tourist Board and the Passport Immigration and Citizenship Authority, um, working together to facilitate the return or the reopening of the destination. This allows for the pre-approval of visitors to the island with health screening and, um, and prior travel history being a feature of being approved to travel to Jamaica, which obviously necessitated the collection of visitor data on the platform and had implications of data storage and data security. You will no doubt recall in February of this year, we learned of the security breaches to the cloud storage server used by the service provider that built the platform. Data protection laws that govern our uh, multiple source markets impact our daily operations, not only because of the potential for security breaches, but they hinder the extent to which we can mine or reuse data for marketing purposes. This, in a fiercely digital marketing environment, presents its own sets of conundrums. The third, um, we'll, I'll speak a little bit about um, airline and, and, and ultimately how it loops into the whole business of um, travel insurance. So our key industry partners are airlines and most of our trade relationships are built on establishing these to increase visitor arrivals ultimately. Air transport took a major blow in 2020 
with an unprecedented number of aircrafts being grounded on tarmacs globally and in hangars for months. Um, as we resume travel, uh, scheduled airlift is not as readily available. And so we look more than ever to special charter um, services, which are privately operated um, air services. Um, charter flights offer you know, different travel terms and conditions. And so the, the matter of travel insurance is on the forefront of most travelers and most destinations today. So the question therefore is where will this leave our, our visitors and how will the destination and accommodation sector together with our airlines interact and it, the managing of the confluence of insurance coverage that is likely to be more uh, a feature of travel going forward um, uh, through this uh, period of the pandemic, but also post pandemic. The fourth area that I'll raise is the is the matter of um, uh, tourism workers, um, you know, and the the whole business of the Redundancy Act, which um, has presented some uh, amount of challenges and public discourse um, through the media um, over time. And so the the return of tourism workers um, to the industry has been staggered uh, and uncertain as most posts were may either made redundant or have not, in some instances, returned in their, uh, their pre-pandemic um, state um, for whatever reason, um, uh, whether it be contracts issues, change of role, change of focus, um, the industry having to pivot into different areas of the industry and therefore jobs and functions of jobs have, have in some instances change. While I say that, I might also say that uh, to date, um, my numbers are that over 70% of our tourism workers have in fact uh, been returned to work. Um, some of them full-time, some of them part-time, some of them on reduced hours based on the flow of the industry in terms of arrivals. Um, so that, that presents its own sets of issue. However, um, the, 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 I suppose the, the, the understanding the challenge, you have to understand um, how, does, how do our industry partners grapple with the re reinstatement of contracts, provide a sense of job security and the financial and social and emotional and in a, in a financially unsecured um, social and um, environmental environment to facilitate um, our most treasured asset being at their best. Um, which is that of our people. Of course, you know, the Redundancy Act provides uh, that uh, if, if, um, if workers are uh, in any way laid off or put out of work for more than 120 days, then the Redundancy Act chips in. But how do you balance that? How do you, is that, is, is it, are those international standards, norms, what changes have happened um, across the world to, 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 to acts like these um, is where I suppose I, I proffer this area for, for, for thought and obviously for consideration by some of our legal luminaries. Uh, the last area um, that I would want to touch on is the whole business of health and safety protocols to protect the citizens uh, of this country and obviously our visitors. As visitors arrive, arrival um, increase and it has steadily done so um, the pandemic remains dynamic and the management of the fully vaccinated visitor on arrival and throughout their stay is still uh, an area of some uncertainty. There is no singular international travel standard for proving fully vaccinated st um, status, nor for the treatment of on arrival and while moving around in the destination. Adhering to our own local laws will take precedence. However, we are mindful of the heightened state of litigation that may arise due to the possibility of visitor developing and or contracting the virus while at a resort property or just across the destination. Entities have chosen to protect themselves by having their clients sign a consent form that indemnifies uh, them or their businesses against um, such actions. Uh, nonetheless, visitors can choose to take legal action for a myriad of reasons, including 
cost of care for themselves, costs for repatriation to their home, physical and emotional effects of the virus on themselves and their family, and effects of mandatory isolation at the property. Uh, these are just some of the areas of concerns. Um, and as I was briefed by, 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 by Sharon in, in presenting some of these areas of challenge, legal challenges, um, or challenges that may be found, uh, or may, solutions may be found in law, um, these, th those five areas, I believe, um, jump at me readily. And I thought I would, I would bring them here today um, for, for, your, for your thoughts and certainly for your, um, for your opinions to be provided against them. And hopefully um, the discourse that will ensue will, uh, will begin to, 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 to analyze some of these thoughts and um, help us to begin to form uh, legal frameworks that could certainly help to, to mitigate against them. With that, um, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for, for, for joining us this morning. And I encourage and hope that the, the discussions that will ensue will be to all our benefits. Thank you so very much. And thank you very much, Donovan, for that very thought provoking presentation, outlining the areas of interest and concern that affect the industry at this time. And um, I think that's why we're here all to see if we can together solve the problems that present themselves to us as a nation, as a region, and to see how best we can work together with the government and others to solve some of these issues. So thank you so much for your timely presentation. And I want to also congratulate um, the tourism sector on its uh, return, um, because uh, my understanding is that many of the hotels are, are fully booked. And so we're looking for a robust um, re-entry and return to normalcy as much as we can at this time. Uh, I'd just like to say to those who are listening in that if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. And at the end of all of the presentations, we will then address um, the questions that you have to the panelists that uh, are relevant to answering those particular questions. All right, so thank you so much again. Uh, so we move on to our next presentation. And um, it is Professor Gilbert Codellini who is going to present, in fact, some of what he has to say, I'm sure is relevant to some of the concerns expressed by Donovan White in the industry. Uh, professor Gilbert Codellini is an emeritus professor of law at the University of the West Indies, where he taught law for 29 years. He has provided numerous expert opinions on negligence in the Caribbean hospitality sector for courts in the United Kingdom and Canada, and in 2020 has published a book entitled Negligence, Liability in the Caribbean Hospitality and Tourism Industry. And I'd like to say that um, many of those books will soon be available if anyone is interested in purchasing you can contact us at the University of the West Indies, Mona. We will have those books for a sale. And um, I just want to thank Professor Codellini for all the books that he has written. He's written practically on every subject. And so we have a real expert here with us this morning and he comes to us from Barbados. So thank you very much, Professor Codellini. Please let us hear your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, subject matter uh, I'm going to speak about today concerns uh, personal injury and negligence law in um, Caribbean hospitality. It's a fairly discreet area, but one which has attracted quite a lot of uh, case law and indeed um, has given rise to many disputes um, where visitors have come to the Caribbean and become injured in a hotel, slip and fall accidents, and uh, those uh, sort of incidents. And um, the, the courts in the Caribbean have dealt with quite a lot of these cases. So what I'd like to do today is just to go through the, the, um, the outline of the personal injury regime. And starting with the uh, first point, which is that a visitor 
who suffers personal injury on hotel or resort premises may bring legal proceedings against the hotel either in her home jurisdiction or in the jurisdiction where the hotel is located. So for example, you have an American visitor, let's call her Connie, who comes to on holiday to a Jamaican hotel and she suffers a slip and fall accident in the hotel. She wants to blame the hotel for the, this accident, saying the hotel is negligent, breach of its duty of care to her. And the issue now is where is she going to sue? Is she going to bring an action in her home country, United States, or is she going to bring an action in Jamaica? Now, there are, there are three reasons why she may prefer to sue in the United States. Uh, firstly, obviously, if she's bringing action in a court near to where she lives, um, there's a point of convenience for her, rather than suing in a court 2,000 miles away. Secondly, um, she will, in most cases in the United States, get a contingency fee uh, agreement with an attorney, um, whereas such contingency fee agreements are generally unavailable in the Caribbean. And thirdly, if she does succeed in the action, she will get much higher damages in the United States than she would um, in the Caribbean. So for those three reasons, she may prefer to sue in her own state, which is, for example, New Jersey, for example, bring an action in New Jersey court rather than suing in the Jamaican court. On the other hand, the uh, defendant hotel uh, might prefer to um, defend the action in, in a Jamaican court rather than in New Jersey. Uh, again, because the damages, if the defendant uh, is uh, found liable, the damages would be much less um, in, in a Jamaican court than, than would be awarded in a court in New Jersey. So how would the defendant uh, try to ensure that the action is brought in Jamaica rather than in New Jersey? Well, there, there are two possible um, ways of, of doing this. Firstly, the foreign non-convenience principle. Um, the defendant could plead in the New Jersey court that the more convenient forum for the action is the Jamaican court rather than New Jersey. For example, because the physical evidence is in, is in Jamaica or the witnesses are available in Jamaica, but the inconvenient to have them proceed to, to New Jersey. Secondly, um, it's possible that the hotel may have had a policy of um, encouraging or insisting rather on visitors signing a forum selection clause, whereby the visitor agrees that in the case of any dispute between her and the hotel, the dispute will be decided in accordance with Jamaican law um, and in the Jamaican courts. Indeed, in the Bahamas, the Atlantis Hotel had a policy of, it, of um, requiring visitors to sign these foreign selection clause contracts, um, which are held to be valid, provided that the visitor had due notice of the um, foreign selection clause before she arrived in the Bahamas. So um, these uh, clauses are another way which the defendant hotel or resort may ensure that the action is heard locally rather than in a foreign court. Um, one other thing which needs to mention is that um, the choice of law, the, the actual the law which is applied in the case, irrespective of whether the case is heard um, in, in the United States or Canada or in, in the Caribbean, the choice of law will normally be the law of the lex loci delicti the law of the place where the accident occurred. And this is certainly true in Canada. The case of Tollison and Jensen is a leading case in Canada where it was held that um, even where the matter is heard in a Canadian court, the proper law to be applied is the law of the jurisdiction where the accident occurred, which in our example would be Jamaica. The United States courts um, have a, a more flexible approach to this. Many of them will, will apply the lex loci delicti, but others will not. So um, the, the trend, however, I think we can say is that the, uh, the, the law which is applied to the law of the Caribbean country where the accident occurred. 
So with that um, preliminary um, issue, um, we could also, I think before we move on, we could also say that the, the parties will normally try to reach an out of court settlement um, if, wherever possible. Um, if they fail to do so, and the matter will then proceed, proceed to trial, of course the, the trial court will either <clears throat> dismiss the action or it will um, fine for the claimant and award damages under the normal heads of damage as you find in personal injury actions, which are of course pain and suffering, loss of enjoyment of life, loss of earnings, medical expenses, and so on and so forth. Alternatively, if the visitor has come to the Caribbean on a package tour organized by a tour operator in her home jurisdiction, she may sue the tour operator, not for negligence in tort, but for breach of the package tour contract on the ground that the promised services were not supplied in accordance with the contract. So now we come to the actual duty of care in the hospitality sector. Uh, the, in the Caribbean, the applicable wearing within a hotel resort or resort premises is contained in the Occupiers Liability Act, which apply in Jamaica, Barbados, St. Lucia and Bermuda, or in the other jurisdictions which don't have Occupiers Liability Acts, but only by common law principles, the rule in Indomar and Dames, which is very similar to the occupiers liability uh, rules. And the, the, uh, the common law applies in the Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, and all the OECS jurisdictions other than St. Lucia. The principles of occupiers liability are very well known. They're very elementary law, but we can just uh, quickly go through, remind ourselves of what they are. Firstly, um, the occupier, um, of the hotel or resort is the entity having the management and control of the premises where the accident occurred. So if the owner of the land or the property in which the hotel or resort is situated is not managing and controlling the property, for example, where the owner has entered into a management contract with a management company and the management company is um, managing and controlling the premises, then the defend the proper defendant in a case of personal injury uh, suffered by a visitor would not be the owner of the property, but the, the management company, which is actually in control at the time of the accident. And there are a couple of Jamaican cases, um, which we don't have time to go into the facts of the cases, but two Jamaican cases which establish this, this uh, point. Um, one is Stern Villa Mora Cottages, and the other one is Minor and Sandals Resort International. Both of these cases are discussed briefly in, in my book, um, and they're also available um, on, the, on the internet. Continuing now with the Occupiers Liability Act. Under the Act, the duty of care is owed to all lawful visitors, which would include all hotel and resort guests, whether they've checked into accommodation, or enter for a temporary purpose, such as dining in the restaurant, or having a drink in the bar, or attending a meeting or conference. They're all visitors for the purposes of the act. So if any of them suffers injury while on the premises, they're entitled to sue under the act. Also, um, people like couriers and those delivering supplies to the resort will also be visitors. Hotel staff and employees are also visitors. But they also have a duty of care, not only as visitors, uh, but also as employ employees at common law. And they also owe duty under relative, uh, relevant occupational health and safety legislation. I believe the Jamaican Act has not yet been brought into force, but there is an act in force in Barbados and in, in the Bahamas. And the Bahamian Act, in fact, has had the subject of quite a lot of um, litigation over the years. So what is the duty owed by the hotel resort? What's the extent of the duty? The duty is to take reasonable care to ensure that the visitor is reasonably safe while on the premises. It's not a duty to guarantee the safety of the 
visitor. So um, the duty of care may be um, carried out by putting a warning notice. For example, if there's a part of the hotel which is dangerous, a warning notice warning the, the visitor to avoid the area may be sufficient to absolve the uh, hotel from liability if there is a slip and fall. Note also that where you have an action brought against a, a hotel, the eggshell skull rule applies. So you take your victim as you find him. Um, the case which illustrates this very nicely is a Jamaican case called Crandall and Jamaica Folly Results, where an American visitor who was obese and had pre existing medical conditions fell from an unstable bar stool and sustained injuries. These injuries required two operations, the second of which led to a heart attack. The consequences of the fall, including the heart attack, would have been much less serious if the claimant had not been obese and not had pre-existing medical conditions. Nevertheless, the hotel was held fully liable for all the consequences of the, of the negligence. Note also that in this context, when you're talking about um, negligence, there are many cases where the claimant herself has been contributory negligent, in which case the court will apportion the damages. So the court may reduce the damages by say 10% or 25% on account of the contributory negligence of the visitor. And an example of that is a very nice uh, case in St. Lucia called uh, Nisham and Harmony Estates. Now, one of the, the commonest um, fall, the, the uh, uh, types of accident in hotels, the slip and fall accidents. These are the commonest type of um, personal injury which occurs in the hotels and resorts. Um, the, as we said before, the mere fact that a visitor slips and falls and gets injured doesn't uh, mean that the hotel will be liable to compensate them. Um, the hotel will only be liable if the hotel has been a breach of its duty of care under the Occupiers Liability Act. Um, one very interesting case which illustrates the, the fact that the court will look at all the circumstances in order to decide whether or not there's been a breach of the duty of care. A Jamaican case called Anantra and Siboni Hotel, uh, where a guest slipped and fell by negotiating a flight of steps in the hotel. The judge recorded, his justice record, pointed out that firstly, the hotel was a, a top class establishment, as he described it. It had maintained high ratings over the years and lived up to international standards. Secondly, the stairs had been constructed by reputable contractors and had received daily maintenance. Thirdly, the stairs were made of a special semi-porous concrete which absorbed water quickly, so therefore they should be less likely to be slipping. Fourthly, before this incident, no guest or employee had reported falling on the stairs in the 10 years of the hotel's operation. The judge pointed out that the courts had observed that, as he, quote, as, he, uh, as he quoted, slipping is one of the most usual incidents in the changes and chances of this mortal life. And there may be no evidence of fault in anybody's part. So in this particular case, the hotel avoided liability. There's no evidence that they'd been negligent. The next type of, um, incident which may cause injury in a hotel is uh, defective fixtures and fittings. And there are one or two examples. For example, uh, about a case in Barbados where a uh, hotel guest went out on her balcony just dressed in her bikini and she closed the uh, glass uh, door behind her. Um, the telephone rang inside the room and she rushed back into the room forgetting that the glass partition had been closed and she cut herself very badly when she came into contact with the glass. The glass shattered and she, she was a seriously a, a cut. Um, the, the question was whether this door was safe. And the Barbados Building Code had stated that um, hotel uh, doors in, in, in hotels, partition doors and sliding doors had to be made of toughened glass. Mm -hmm. And the evidence was that this particular door was not made of toughened glass. It was something called annealed glass, which is notoriously uh, dangerous because it could easily shatter and, and cut. The, the person. Um, another example where you had um, a hot tub, a defective hot tub in a hotel in the Bahamas, which caused actually caused the death of the visitor. Um, and a, a third example, a case in Jamaica where a refrigerator 
in the in the lobby uh, was had dangerously exposed uh, electric wire, and a visitor was was uh, injured when she came into contact with the wire. So these are all cases where injury is caused by defective fixtures and fittings and uh, equipment. And again, um, if it is shown that the, the negligence of the hotel uh, was the cause of the injury, then the visitor will uh, succeed in damages against the hotel. The next type of um, um, incident where injury may be caused is in the swimming pool. Um, there are, in fact, no Caribbean cases um, on this topic. Right? At least I, couldn't, I haven't found any uh, Caribbean case on this topic, but there are quite a few cases which uh, uh, occurred in Mediterranean countries uh, where British uh, visitors were injured by swimming in a swimming pool accident. Um, in some cases, it was shown that the, the swimming pool had been constructed in breach of local regulations local building codes, which require things like non-slip borders around the side of the pool. Um, in these cases, however, if the, it was not proved that the lack of these safety features had caused the accident. In fact, in one case, the claimant who dived into the shallow end of the pool and, and struck his head and suffered severe injury, he was intoxicated at the time. And so the fact that they that there's a breach of the local regulations and having not having non-slip tiles around the pool was irrelevant to the, the cause of the accident and therefore the hotel was not liable. Um, next we come to uh, uh, drowning and beach incidents or so one of this case Frecklinger and Preble where an unfortunate visitor to Jamaica uh, was drowned when he he dived into the into the sea immediately after arriving um, in, in the hotel. Um, he'd been warned by the, his wife and by the hotel that the sea was rough and he shouldn't get in, into the water, he should wait a bit. But he was so keen, eager, you know, to, to, to get into the water, to dive into the water and was unfortunately drowned. And he brought an action against the hotel, but the action failed because the, um, the drowning was entirely his own, his own fault. He'd been warned not to, not to go to the water and he, he recklessly decided to go ahead and that was the, the, uh, the result. On the other hand, in Trinidadian uh, case, so it happened in Tobago, the case of Barry Lesso and Pigeon Point Heritage Park. This was a case where two visitors were injured when they were struck by a jet ski um, close to the, the beach. And it was held that the Heritage Park, who are in control of the beach area, should have put up warning signs to warn people not to swim in the area where, where jet skis were operating. Um, and so therefore, the um, the occupier was in fact liable there for failure to put up warning notices and to ensure that the swimmers were not brought into contact with um, with um, watercraft and uh, jet skis. This is something which was written in one case called Abrahamson and Rich Carlton Hotel, where an American visitor to, to Jamaica went into a re restaurant and suffered a heart attack while in the while in the restaurant. Um, the hotel didn't have any equipment, emergency equipment to deal with somebody having a heart attack. And the question was whether the hotel being a, a five-star you know, uh, establishment ought to have the necessary equipment to deal with the, uh, the medical emergency. It was held that um, the only duty of the hotel where there's a medical emergency not caused by the negligence of the hotel, um, the only duty of the hotel is to uh, summon um, medical help as soon as possible, and until help arrives to provide basic first aid. And that's what the, the hotel did in that case, and therefore they were not liable for failure to have the proper equipment to, to um, deal with the medical emergency. Finally, um, unfortunately, there are occasional um, criminal uh, take place um, in, in um, hotels. The hotel is under a duty to provide adequate security for its premises, taking into account the crime profile of the area and the foreseeable risk of assaults and criminality. So it's a question of fact as to whether the hotel was in a, a dangerous area or a safe area, and as to whether the hotel management had taken sufficient um, precautions to prevent crime, to protect the, their visitors from the effects of criminals. 
Uh, of course, where the management has knowledge of a previous assault on its premises, it will be in, on, under duty to warn visitors. And the Bahamian case, Fabry's case, illustrates that. In some instances, uh, quite recently, there have been complaints that visitors have been assaulted by employees of the hotel itself. These are very unfortunate incidents, um, in which case, if that is proved, then of course the hotel will be vicariously liable for the assault and any injury uh, sustained. Well, I think I've, I've covered what you could say are the main um, areas where you could find personal injury in the hotel um, hospitality context. Um, and um, of course, um, the, the cases which emerge in these areas um, are very instructive. If you can get a chance to read, read the cases, you find uh, a lot of interesting points made in how the courts would, how, how the courts solve uh, these the legal issues where you have personal injury in the hospitality context. I think that's a wraps up more or less what I want to say. Thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you so much. Professor Cardellini, I found myself taking notes as if I was in class. So I have learned quite a bit myself on the subject. And thank you so much for that very comprehensive overview of the law of negligence in the hotel and hospitality industry. Um, again, I'd like to speak to those who are listening and those who are participants here. If you have questions, please put them in the chat so that uh, the relevant panelists can answer your questions at the end. We'll have about 20 minutes at the end of the presentations in which we can take questions and answers. Thank you again, Professor Cardellini, for that excellent overview. All right, so we move on now to Ms. Helen Liu who is a member of Myers Fletcher and Gordon's commercial department. Uh, Ms. Liu holds a Bachelor of Laws as well as a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Biology and a Master of Science in Marine and Terrestrial Ecosystems. So this is a very qualified person to speak to us on the environment. Good morning, Ms. Liu. Thank Good you. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Madam Chair. Chair. So let me Thank just share you. my screen. Good morning, all. So I will be discussing sustaining the environment while developing tourism with you all today. So tourism, no doubt, is one of the Caribbean's biggest income earners. It's also one of the biggest foreign exchange earners. Certainly in Jamaica, there has been a lot of investment and development in tourism over the years. We see all these hotels going up. We see a lot of the attractions going up. And it, it's beneficial to the country. There's no doubt about that. However, a lot of people might not think of the negative environmental impacts that can result from, in, um, from tourism and what it means for our, to our environment when we, we have all these developments going up. Currently, there are laws in place for, you know, in terms of development and, and, and the operations of, of entities. So I've just created a slide and I've just thrown up randomly some of the environmental issues that, that we face. I'm not going to go through all of them. What I have done for this presentation, given the time constraint, is I've just picked out a few of the environmental issues that we um, that I'll discuss with you. And I've also picked out some of the, what I would call the key or main pieces of legislation to discuss as well. So the first issue that I will discuss is beach access. So everybody loves their beaches. We live in Jamaica or a lot of us live in the Caribbean or in Jamaica presumably and beaches are, a drive away, we can go and enjoy them. They're, they're big selling points for tourism. However, sometimes in developing beach related tourist attractions, um, structures will go up on the beaches, jetties, groins, marinas, or things like seagrass can be removed. 
what this does is that it impacts, it changes the ecosystem of that beach that can have negative environmental impacts further on. Additionally, when somebody puts that much money into developing an area, they want to protect it. And we can all understand that that's, that's natural human instinct, really. So you, what you'll find is a lot of people will start fencing off or restricting access to the beaches. They only want their paying customers to go. That will sometimes create a lot of tension with the locals because it's always argued that beaches should be accessible to all. It's, it's a public commodity. People ought not to be able to own beaches per se. Another environmental issue that, that we see stemming from tourism is water quality issues. A lot of the times increased tourism activities in coastal areas will be associated with increased runoff, runoff from the land areas and along with that pollution. So if rains, water will wash from the, the land areas into the sea. In that water, what you could find is that you have higher nutrients, a lot more chemicals, a lot more pollution. It's only natural when you're, when you're having more activity on land, things like cut more cars on the road, the tires on the road, when, what, when the rains come, you know, the water washes over the roads and it takes some of that with it into the sea. Higher levels of pollution can lead to a decline in water quality. A decline in water quality can lead to things like increased algal, algae growth in the, in, in the sea, um, higher water temperatures, higher turbidity, and how that will impact the environment is all these things can lead to a de degradation of, of the, the, the environment that the corals need to thrive. Corals are very specific. They, they need a certain temperature. They need a certain nutrient level. But when you introduce all these chemicals and pollutants into the sea, it disrupts it. And then you can have bleaching events. Another one of the issues I want to discuss is just loss of ecosystems. So when you, you're trying to have these developments go up, you have to put it somewhere. So what that can lead to is a loss of, of certain habitats and ecosystems. For example, mangroves. You, you go in, you dump upon them, you, you take out the mangroves and you dump upon the area. But what this means is that the loss of, of, of the mangroves can lead to a, a decline in water quality as well. How mangroves work is that they actually act as filtrations or buffer systems. So they're at the edge of the coastline, water is coming from the land, they hit the mangroves first. In that water, you could have very, very high nutrient levels or sediments. The mangroves will act as absorption. They'll absorb a lot of the nutrients or they'll, they'll filter a lot of the sediment before it gets into the marine, marine environment. Mar uh, mangroves are also nurseries and, and habitats for a lot of fish. So when you move that, the nurseries are gone, the habitat is gone. That leads to a decline in water quality. It also, once again, it starts increasing your algae and your nutrient levels in the water. And it just generally leads to a decline in water quality. Also, interestingly, a lot of studies show that mangroves protect the coastline in that when we have hurricanes and, 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 and things like tsunami events, if it hits the mangrove first, the water level, the, the energy is absorbed by the mangro mangrove systems. So it's, it's almost like a double function there. So I'm going to move on to some of the key pieces of legislation that we have. And I will be going through the Natural Resources Conservation Authority Act, the Town and Country Planning Act, the Beach Control Act, the Watersheds Protection Act, and the Wildlife Protection Act. I promise you I've just extracted you know, sections. So I won't be doing very, very lengthy pieces on each. So the first one is the Natural Resources Conservation Act or the NRCA Act. It is actually what I would think is the, the primary piece of legislation that deals with environmental matters. Under section nine of the NRCA Act, the minister may prescribe areas or categories of activities, constructions or development, which require a permit issued by the authority. So under the NRCA, 
regulations were promulgated and the, the regulation is the natural resources prescribed areas prohibition of categories of enterprise construction and development order, which sets out the activities and classes of constructions, which requires a permit. So I've just taken out the ones that are tourism related. So that would include things like marinas and boatyards need permits, ecotourism activities and nature tourism needs permits, theme parks, golf courses. Under section 12 of the NRCA Act, um, it is an offense for any person to discharge or cause or permit entry into waters, any poisonous, noxious, noxious or polluting matter, except under and in accordance with the license. Any person is not defined in the legislation. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean just, for instance, a shipper or the, or the hotel. So any person presumably would be caught under this legislation. And this section also, so this section is wider, so it, wide, so it will capture things like oil spills, as well as trade effluent or sewage effluent that's released into the environment. And for the trade and sewage effluent, that is the natural resources conservation, wastewater and sludge reg regulations that will regulate this. So those regula re regulations speak to the need of a permit, that you know what the standards of the water should be before you release it, et cetera. So section 16 of the NRCA provides that where it appears that any polluting matter is present in any waters, the authority may remedy or mitigate any pollution or restore the waters to a state that they were in before or as far as reasonably practical. So this means that if they see a polluting event, the authority doesn't have to sit down and, and, and try to figure out who's responsible for the sake of the environment. They can go in and initiate cleanup right away. Under Section 18 of the NRCA Act, the authority may serve an enforcement notice on a person who appears to have carried out an activity which poses a serious threat to nature, to natural resources or to public health. That means NRCA slash Nepal can come onto your premises if they get noticed that something amiss is going or you're releasing something into the environment and they can serve you an enforcement notice on you. The enforcement notice will specify the steps that should be taken, um, the time period that these steps should be taken to ameliorate the effect or to, to restore the area back to its, its original state. So that's just, we're going to move on to development. So when you're trying to establish new new places or or establish new places or to change uses of buildings, etc. Under the Town and Country Planning Act, um, develop means the development means the carrying out of building, engineering, mining, or other operations in, on, over, or under land or the making of any material change in the use of any buildings or other land. Pursuant to section 11 of the TCPA, an application must be made to the local planning authority for permission to develop land if the area is covered by a development order under the act. Where an application is made to the local planning authority, permission um, granted by the local planning authority may be either unconditional or conditional. The local planning authority can also refuse the application. And when they're making these decisions, they have to keep in mind what the existing development order is for that particular area. They can't do anything that is contrary to whatever has been set out for that particular parish. So where's, where's the provisions of section nine of the NRCA Act applies. That's, that's the provision where you have to get a permit from the NRCA authority. Um, in respect of a development, planning permission shall not be granted unless an application to the authority has been made as required and the authority has granted or has signified in writing its intention to grant the permit under the NRCA Act. Where an application is refused by the local planning authority or the, the authority under the NRCA Act, an applicant can appeal to the minister. So we're going to move on to legislation that deals with beaches generally. We discussed before how important beaches are to tourism. So 
under Section 3 of the Beach Control Act or the BCA, all rights in and over the foreshore of the island and the floor of the sea are vested in the Crown. Foreshore means that portion of land adjacent to the sea that lies between the ordinary high and, water, and low water marks, being alternately covered and uncovered as the tide ebbs and flows. Floor of the sea means the soil and the subsoil of the sea off the coast of Jamaica between the low water mark and the outer limits of the territorial sea of Jamaica. So all rights in or over the foreshore or the floor of the sea, which were acquired before June 1, 1956 under the Registration of Titles Act or any express grant or license from the Crown are preserved. Section four of the BCA states that any person who is the owner or occupier of any adjoining land or any part of the foreshore and any member of his family and any private guest of his shall be entitled to use that part of the foreshore adjoining his land for private domestic purposes. Under the BCA, private purposes is defined as bathing, fishing and other like forms of recreation and, and, and means of access to the sea for, for the same purposes. Section five of the BCA prohibits a person from encroaching on or using the foreshore or the floor of the sea for any public purpose or for or, or, for, or in connection with any trade or business or commercial enterprise. Sorry. So section nine goes on to say that no person shall erect, construct, or maintain any dock, wharf, pier, or jetty on the foreshore or the sea or any structure related to the jetties, et cetera, without the authority of a license. So a license under Section 9 of the Beach Control Act is made under the Beach Control Crown Licenses Regulations 1956. Um, Section 11 of the, of the BCA states that the Beach Control Authority may on application grant licenses for the use of the foreshore or the floor of the sea for any public purpose in connection with any business or trade. So in other words, if you as an entity want to commercialize a beach area or any part of the beach, you have to make an application to the Beach Control Authority. And you make these applications for licenses under the Beach Control Licensing Regulations 1956. Um, licensees are entitled to renew the license but for the 12 month periods. And if you are a hotel or a commercial, commercial or public recreational beach, you will also be affected by the Beach Control Hotel Commercial Public Relation, Recreational Beaches Regulations 1978. So those regulations regulate the, the behaviors so who can sell on the beach, what you can't do, do on, the, on that particular stretch, stretch. So another piece of important legislation is the water resources. Um, what it deals with our water resources. So tourism can be very, can utilize a whole lot of water and Jamaica's is known for its droughts. So water, the Watershed Protection Act helps manage our resources generally all over the island. So a what, so what it is is that you'll have an area that rains. If an area is a watershed area, if an area that rains, that area will have certain geographic features that will help channel the rain into rivers, et cetera, where we can later on utilize it. So under section four of the Watersheds Protection Act, it shall be the duty of the authority with a view to promoting the conservation of water resources to institute such measures and to recommend to the minister for the implementation of such programs as it considers necessary for the protection of those areas which constitute or adjoin the watersheds of an island. Under section five of the Watersheds Act, the minister may upon the recommendation of the NRCA declare an area to be a watershed area. Under section six of the Watersheds Act, during the continuance in, in force of an order made under section five in the watershed area, um, the, the, the controls and restrictions imposed will have effect notwithstanding any other enactment. In other words, 
if an area is declared a watershed protection area, it is important that development occurs in, a, in accordance with whatever the authority has deemed necessary to ensure that water runs off properly into the sea and that we're able to catch the water properly so that we don't have ex exacerbated drought conditions. I'm, I'm going to also look, take a look at the Wildlife Protection Act. So pursuant to section six and six A of the Wildlife Protection Act, it is an offense to hunt or to be in possession of the whole or any part of a protected animal. This could affect tourism attractions that, that offer interactions with certain species of dolphins or birds. Um, it, it also, certain species of corals are protected. So you have to ensure that you don't damage certain corals, et cetera. Um, however, there's an exception where the minister can, can allow an exemption under this if it's for scientific, historic, or educational purposes. Uh, under, the, under Section 11 of the Wildlife Protection Act, it is an offense for every person who causes noxious or polluting matter to flow into any harbor, river, canal, lagoon, or estuary containing fish. The offense is punishable by a fine not exceeding 100,000 Jamaican dollars or to imprisonment not exceeding two years or to both such a fine and imprisonment. Along with a fine or imprisonment, um, section 23.2 of the Wildlife Protection Act also allows the court, court to have discretion to, whether or not to, to seize the boat or to have the boat forfeited to the Crown if the boat has been used in, in the carrying out of an offense. So, those are the main pieces of legislation that I have gone through. And that, that's what we have in place as the legislative framework or we have in place in terms of development and operating establishments that could be tourism related. You know, as I said, tourism is a, is a great income earner and foreign exchange earner for, for the Caribbean generally. However, people sometimes don't, are not cognizant of the stress that tourism activities can have on the environment. You know, yes, we have laws that are in place, but do they really go far enough? You know, maybe what we should be thinking of is should we be updating some of this legislation for better enforcement or harsher penalties? You know, you know, another another thing that we have always been we've been thinking about for a while is, you know, could Jamaica focus more on smaller entities for tourism, more, more ecotourism instead of the mass hotels? Etc. You know, is that something that Jamaica wishes to consider moving forward in, in terms of our legislative framework? So that's my presentation. Well, that was such a thought-provoking presentation, Miss Sue. I much information there for us on the environment and the need to protect the environment while balancing the need for the tourism industry as well. So perhaps um, we can have some discussion around that um, further on when after we've finished all of the presentations. So I'm looking forward to some lively discussion in that area. Thank you so much, Ms. Lou. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And now we're going to move on to the uh, labor law section. So we're, so we're dealing now with persons in the industry. And we have Mrs. Carla Ann Harris Roper, who is a UWI law graduate and an attorney at law. Her area of specialty is labor and employment law. She is the co-author of the highly regarded text, Commonwealth Caribbean Employment and labor law. She's very well versed in the subject. And so we're very happy to have her today. Thank you so much, Ms. Roper. Please go ahead. So good morning, everyone. Um, I do hope that we're all doing well and are safe. So I'm just going to seek to um, share my screen so we can proceed with the presentation. My presentation will look at some aspects of labor and how it impacts tourism. And um, um, tourism is, apart from the fact that it is, um, you know, a very 
specialized area. The, the laws are not, for the most part, specifically geared towards the industry. So much of what you will hear today um, would have general application across other industries. So I think we can all agree, especially you know, from the presentation that we had by the Director of Tourism, that across the Caribbean, it's a major source of revenue and jobs. And um, a key sustainability pillar for all mid and long-term national development strategies across our sister islands. Um, the ILO um, indicated that, you know, based on COVID-19, um, there's induced a collapse of the, se the sector, um, and that has had negative economic growth for the Caribbean. Um, I must say that my presentation will focus more around the impact of COVID-19 on employment related matters for this purpose. Now in the Caribbean, the ILO also indicated that the tourism industry directed to 33% of GDP over and over 52% of export receipts, um, approximately 30 million annual entries per year, um, in terms of persons visiting the Caribbean, the majority of which are cruise ship passengers or from the US. Um, the industry provides direct employment across the region to over 413,000 workers. Um, I think I heard the director also indicate um, close to 170 odd thousand directly employed. Um, and that's not counting the linkages across the various sectors. So this figure represents an average of 18.1% 18, 18 of total employment. And if we, if we talk about the indirect and induced employment, that could very well rise up to 43%. Now, from a Jamaican perspective, I had a quick look at our Minister of Tourism sectoral debate presentation on April 20 of this year. So important was tourism, ladies and gentlemen, that the tourism um, presentation started the sectoral debate this year. Um, and he pointed us to the fact that last fiscal year, we lost direct revenue from tourism, 46.3 billion through airport charges, taxes, guest accommodation, room taxes, GCT, the TEF, um, and cruise taxes, among other government related taxes. So, with the reopening of our borders in June 15 last year, total number of stopover arrivals up to March 21 was a shade under 500,000. Um, and there were of course no cruise ship passengers during that time. The anticipated number of arrivals, which was 2.8 million stopover for April to March 2021, um, has, the, has the government estimating expenditure of 199 billion. But when we look at what happened last year, we saw a decline in earnings of about 62%. He's however hopeful and can report that 2021 so far has been positive. They've welcomed up until the time of this presentation, 40,000 visitors and up to March, 69,000. And we have made US 360 million. So basically it is looking up for tourism, which is one of our major economic drivers. Now, one of the main, if not the, the main, um, physical attribute that is going to assist tourism is the people. So we can have the nice beaches, the nice um, trails, jogging trails, and all the other tourism related products. But what makes tourism work is our people. And that um, 
the impact of COVID-19 has really taken a toll in terms of our employment in this sector. In preparing for this um, presentation, I reached out to some tourism stakeholders, um, spoke to some union officers, HR persons within the industry, um, persons who are running um, various tourism related establishments and look at the regulatory framework. And these were the top five to six um, issues that they pointed us to. And I'm going to pay great attention to the first three. So COVID-19 testing and vaccinations and the impact of that, layoffs and redundancy, what happened and what the industry can do to address this um, situation. Um, having looked back at it now with the lenses that we now have. Safety in working conditions um, ties in with the testing and vaccination regime. Um, they've also looked at flexibility in working relationships. Again, the director pointed to the fact of um, in his information about 70% of the uh, tourism workers are back at the job in various forms, different terms and conditions, some of them, um, but we are seeing uh, uh, an uptick um, in the workers coming back on along with the tourism, the tourists, I'm sorry, coming back. Um, there was the issue of the pension scheme. I'm not, I don't know if many of us remember that just before um, we had um, our friend Miss Corona visiting that we were just ramping up the tourism pension scheme. And with the impact of Corona that has taken a hit, um, but hopefully that will be able to come on stream in full force shortly. I'm going to touch quickly on this whole question of the government's um, response in the tourism sector in terms of seeking to cushion the blows to um, tourism workers in the form of best cash and um, union representation and how that has been dealt with during the pandemic. So let's take a look um, at the COVID-19 vaccinations. Um, this has been quite a topic for discussion. Um, and the minister in his budget, um, in his sectoral debate presentation, indicated that he was pleased to announce that recently they had begun vaccination of persons working in the tourism sector to ensure both their safety and that of their visitors. Um, he styled them as frontline workers in Jamaica's number one service sector that will aid in the quick and full recovery of the industry. Interestingly, ladies and gentlemen, he also pointed to the fact that the CDC from the US issued new guidance to the cruise shipping industry, including the need for vaccinations of prospective travelers on the cruise ships in order for the, that um, sector to resume. So right away, we are seeing that within the tourism sector, this issue of vaccination is coming up, not just in respect of workers, but also in respect of um, prospective visitors. He also pointed to the fact of um, Gen C travelers, as he called them, that are travelers whose experience and expectations have been shaped by health and safety risks, risk of the pandemic, the requirements for social distancing, enhanced hygiene, requirements for testing, quarantines, vaccines to travel, and psychological impacts of lockdown, which build demand for escape and exploration. So in pointing out these Gen C travelers, he is saying that we need to capitalize um, and use the pandemic 
to build back stronger and facilitate the needs of these um, prospective visitors. Now, in so doing, we have to look at what is the what are the implications for providing um, safe workplaces for the workers that we would be requiring to come back to work, even as we interact with visitors who we could say to some degree, um, um, create some level of risk, seeing that some of them are coming from various areas where the, the virus may still be very prevalent and importantly, know as we listen to our newscasts that we have um, the various um, variants, um, which in and of themselves can create higher levels of risk. So um, we have the, the common law precepts coming from the, that um, Locus Classicus, Wilson and Clyde Gold, Cole and English that um, gives places a duty on the employer to provide safe workplaces um, with those non-delegable duties um, to take reasonable care to ensure safety of the employee. So we should have competent fellow workers, safe plant and equipment, a safe place of work and safe systems of working with effective supervision. So <clears throat> whilst that is the common law, where there are statutory provisions that impose specific duties on an employer, which is dependent on the nature of their operations. So for example, those who work in factories, the provisions of the Factories Act would apply. So when we speak generally, um, the tourism sector, apart from those general provisions, such as um, professional Professor um, Codellini pointed us to like occupational, um, the Occupiers Liability Act, for example, there's nothing specific that points directly to the tourism sector. However, the various orders that have been made pursuant to the Disaster Risk Management Act since last year have made specific provisions for the tourism sector Again, I'd have to thank um, the director pointing us again in the discussion around the resilient corridor and this concept along with the, in conjunction with the operations of the various COVID-19 protocols have created a benchmark and framework for the employer within the tourism sector to meet that duty to ensure safe workplaces as far as is possible. We also note that we are still discussing our Occupational Safety and Health Act. We, that bill, sorry, is now still, as I understand it, being considered by a joint select committee of parliament. And we are very hopeful that um, that bill, that, that report from the joint select committee will be provided shortly so that this, this act, which would be, we are hoping a comprehensive review of health and safety in this country will come into existence shortly. Now, in the context of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the employer within the tourism industry will obviously have a duty to take reasonable steps to ensure as best as is possible that their workplaces provide safe environments, not just to employees, but also customers, clients, visitors. So they should ensure that these particular provisions that relate to the, to the tourism industry under the risk management orders are adhered to. That's one of the major issues from my seat that I've been seeing. We've been having a lot of um, provisions put in place, but as some persons have, you know, the, the saying goes, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So it's going to be critical that not just we put in place these orders, but there are provisions put in place within the various tourism sector organizations and workplace settings to ensure that they are adhered to. So providing protective, 
personal protective equipment devices, such as masks, putting up protective barriers, sanitizing stations, social distancing protocols, and implementing other work arrangements that can reduce the possible incidence of exposure to COVID-19 are critical elements of this duty. We also should note that the Labor Relations Code, which is a very, very critical part of our labor law, Lexis, um, has in fact a provision there that speaks to managing in, in um, provisions where there are epidemic or infectious diseases. So it also provides that management has a duty to furnish, equip, and otherwise provide factories, workshops, offices, and other places where work is to be performed with such facilities to meet the reasonable requirements of safety, health, and welfare regulations, and to adopt suitable measures for worker protection and the prevention of the spread of epidemics or infectious diseases, and to organize their work in such a manner as to provide insofar as possible the best guarantee for workers' safety. So as we would perhaps know, the Labor Relations Code is uh, subsidiary legislation that should any matter get to the Industrial Disputes Tribunal, the tribunal is mandated to see whether or not the provisions of the code have been complied with in making their decisions. And therefore, um, even outside of the, the disasters management protocols, um, employers within the sector should be clear that the, L the LRC also provides some guidance. Now, very critical issue now, a great point of discussion is what should we do about this vaccine? Administering the COVID-19 vaccine is another measure which could assist the employer in meeting their obligations to create a safe workplace. However, this option raises other issues which the employer must navigate to ensure they are not exposed to liability. And I want to raise the following points for our consideration. One major aspect is that currently the vaccine is not universally accessible in Jamaica, indeed across the Caribbean, although I do believe we are getting various um, types of vaccines coming from various places. Our government has taken the position that um, the vaccines that we will use are the ones that have been certified by the WHO. So that reduces the pool of vaccine that we can access. We understand that. But in saying that an employee should be mandatorily vaccinated, we must consider that if there is no vaccine with the best will in the world, an employee is not going to be able to get that. And we would have seen what happened in the last couple of weeks as we now await um, new shipments of the vaccine. Now, when it comes on to statutory provisions regarding requiring people to be vaccinated, that is a matter that is going to be public um, for the government to make a decision on. I checked under the public health immunization regulations made under the Public Health Act and see that there is that provision um, for children to be immunized. Um, and that's mandatory, it puts a duty on the parent for the child to be immunized. But even then, there may be applicable exclusions for example, where the child has what is called contraindications um, if, they, if they are um, allergic or if they are not physically fit to be immunized. So whilst it is, um, we have a, a sort of somewhat oblique parallel to mandatory vaccinations in this country, even then we have seen that there can be um, exclusions. And so if the government takes this route, which we do not know, um, there will most likely be exclusions. Now, the vaccine does not provide immunity from contracting or transmitting the virus. 
Its effectiveness is in the fact that um, scientific studies suggest that the virus's impact on persons who receive it will be less and the risk of death is greatly diminished. So when we look at mandating the vaccine, this is not a, a quote unquote silver bullet. What it does is reduces the risk. And that is something that has to be contemplated in my view. Jamaicans have the right under our constitution to freedom of thought, conscience, protection of private and family life. So persons by the, the highest law in the land have the right to choose whether or not they subject they wish to subject themselves to being vaccinated under these grounds. So what then can an employer do? In the tourism industry, what can we do? Much will depend on the specific circumstances of each case. So it is my view that in the case of new hires, people who are coming on new, the employer could require um, that a prospective employee be immunized as a condition of employment. Um, much like in, in certain, certain jobs, for example, um, dealing with children, um, you could request uh, a police record to see if the person has any, any prior convictions or working in the food service industry, where, for example, the, a food handler's permit is required. Um, so the employer could, in such a case, have the prospective employee be aware that this is a requirement and then they're at liberty to make a choice as to whether or not they will voluntarily subject themselves to vaccination in order to access this employment. But what of persons who are already employed? How can those persons be addressed? And this, this, I think, is a little bit more of a ticklish situation. So to insist on an employee being vaccinated as a condition for continued employment could be considered a breach of the employment contract if there is no existing right. So if you have a contractual right that speaks to something like that, then the employee would have already accepted it and therefore could be bound by it. But if it does not exist, then it could be considered a breach of contract. If the employer seeks to mandate, it could then be a unilateral change of the contract and the employee may choose to resign um, as this being a fundamental breach and claim constructive dismissal and the attendant compensation. Uh, my own view is that if termination should be considered, a mutual separation could also be contemplated between the parties. But I am very aware that there have been discussions surrounding whether an employer can in furtherance of ensuring that they meet their duty to provide safe workplaces um, after giving employees adequate notice, um, and a process may choose to dismiss. It's a balance between the employer seeking to ensure a safe place of work for all the employees, customers, clients, in our case in the tourism industry, persons who are visitors on the one hand and the employees um, right to choose. Now that as far as I'm aware has not yet been tested. Um, this is going to be something in the employment law sphere that I'd be anxiously watching because there are arguments on both sides of that equation. But one thing, ladies and gentlemen, I want it to, to be my own view and sharing it candidly is that the, the, the type of um, import and importance that is being placed on vaccination or properly also to be placed on all those other protocols, the social distancing, the mask wearing, the sanitization, all of those other related um, protocols that have been put in to create the very same safe environment for work still need to be given the same level of import as it would the vaccination. And that is important that everybody within the tourism industry should contemplate. Okay, not moving. Okay. Um, in the case um, where we are already employed, we have already spoken to the fact that 
you know, we don't have universal access. So that creates a challenge in terms of mandating. And we have also seen in recent times that persons, for example, would have started a course of vaccinations and because of um, unavailability, I, I remember seeing in the, in the Gleno whether or not you can mix and match the vaccines. That is something that you know, may have a challenge. Persons in employment may have an issue with, and those, those things may impact on their decision as to whether or not they would wish to be vaccinated. So recommendations quickly, um, provide the employees with all relevant information with, around the vaccine, give them information, knowledge is power. Um, in the tourism industry, provide all the information, get the folks in from the Ministry of Health and Wellness, your doctors, so that they can make their own informed decision. Um, where there are employment um, representation, like unions or staff association, co-op them into helping to make that um, information shared with the employees to encourage them to um, you know, get vaccinated as part of getting the tourism sector back um, based on the obvious needs of our country, given what we spoke of earlier. Um, there is no legal impediment to employers provided incentives. So for example, discretionary bonuses, other tangible benefits um, to incent an employee to um, consider taking the vaccine. However, employers within the industry should contemplate that when they take these decisions, it's imperative that they do not act discriminatory um, because that may impact staff morale and create industrial relations issues. So last point, as I get ready to step down, is this whole issue of layoffs and redundancies. When the pandemic hit um, and we had our first case on March 10, a seminal date in Jamaican history 2020, many of us did not know what to expect. And none the least of that was the tourism industry. If we recall, that was the height of the winter tourist season. I'm sure we had lots of visitors um, and our, our various hotels and properties could very well have been fully booked. Then we had you know, to assist in having all these folks get to their homes and the tourism industry for a little while came to a standstill. But what of the employment relations? how would the employer react? So the first point of contact was the layoff. And, you know, um, the tourism industry needed to know when to make the decision to lay off, how to communicate a layoff, um, what if they had to set a time frame for layoff, um, could they continue paying employees during the period of layoff? And these are issues that, you know, came home very quickly and vividly within all industries and tourism was not immune. Um, in all the Caribbean jurisdictions that I have noted here, there are some provisions, but there are also common law um, guidelines for that in terms of contractual obligations. Under the Jamaican Act, um, basically an employee who has been laid off for a period not in excess of um, in excess, sorry, of 120 days can elect to be regarded as being dismissed by reason of redundancy by following the provisions um, in respect of how you give the notice. And that is noted in section 5A of the ETRPA. Additionally, um, the employer who is laid off without pay other than on disciplinary grounds, um, he's laid off without paying accordance to the terms of his contract, or if you see I have here in bold, the circumstances of his employment are so changed that for some period he receives no pay pending the decision of his employer to reinstate previous or similar circumstances of employment. Now, what this means, therefore, is that there was no direct provisions, <clears throat> sorry, that indicated that there's any need for formal notice timeframes. That's my interpretation of it. This could be by nature of the fact that, you know, these are circumstances we were ex expected to be sudden, unexpected, and to set out giving notice could 
defeat the purpose of utilizing the provisions. Um, and the layoff was clearly expected based on the, the wording of the provisions to not be permanent. It says pending the decision to reinstitute um, employment. Now, at the end of the 120 days, <clears throat> it's the option of the employee to elect whether they wish to be made redundant. And what we saw after that first, those first um, frantic moves within the industry and across the country was that persons, employers, um, and in, in, in the tourism's case, Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association, along with the Jamaica Employers Federation, making lobbyings lobbying for that 120 day cap to be extended because some businesses simply had not recovered and they would have cash flow issues if employees were seeking to make that election. Some countries extended the periods whereby the employee would not be allowed to make claims. Um, the Ministry of Labor indicated that any extension of the 120 day shield against the employee claims would need legislative amendment. So to my mind, this whole layoff issue and what came with it came as what I am calling a March surprise to the tourism industry, they caught flat-footed um, and they didn't quite know how to deal with it. So the question then arises, given the challenges that have been exposed by the, the COVID-19 pandemic, what should be the legal position on the matter? What we found that when this amendment to the act came out in 1986, it asked, it made provisions for regulations to be made to give guidance as to how to deal with layoffs. Unfortunately, no regulations were ever made. There is nothing, for example, to stop an employee, an employer from at the 120 days recalling um, employees, even for one day, and then thereafter reinstituting layoffs. And I think therefore we need to reconsider how layoffs are administered um, and looking at it. Other legislative structures can also be established to address the employment related shocks that can arise in similar events. So it need not be a pandemic. It could be a very bad hurricane or an earthquake that impacts in the same way. And what we found was the government jumping in and um, in the case of the Tourism Industry instituted best cash, which is still ongoing. I think I heard Minister Clark saying that it's further extended, but this was just a simple um, one-off provision for this specific um, issue. So my position is that we really, at this point in time, in Jamaica at least, needs to examine unemployment insurance legislation to contemplate how best to deal with situations such as this. I know we are strapped for time, so I'm going to stop the presentation now. And I do hope that um, we would have had quite a bit to consider, um, not just for the tourism industry in employment related issues, but also across the spectrum of employment here in Jamaica. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Carla and Harris Roper for that very informative and relevant presentation. The issues that now face the industry on mammoth, I think, in terms of employment and employment law. And we need some direction as to how to handle legislation and also to give some advice as to how legislation needs to be amended. So thank you so much for that contribution. And now we're going to go to the question and answer uh, period. And in fact, there are a number of questions. If the um, presenters could um, turn your um, cameras on once again. So there are a number of questions. First of all, um, in the chat, I see uh, for a number of our participants. Okay, so the first question is for, I think it's directed perhaps at Professor Codellini. A quite comprehensive presentation, Professor Codellini. Can the hotel be made liable for paying enforced individual penalties in fines against a tourist found in breach of attending an entertainment event on the property 
where no permit was granted to hold the event. Example, Rick's Cafe. I don't know if you're familiar with that particular event, but the question is, if a tourist goes to an event that is not permitted by law, what do you think is the liability there for either the tourist or the, the hotel? Um, that sounds like criminal liability. That has the, what's the connection with negligence? Okay, no connection so, with negligence. Hmm. Is that? Well, I, I don't know if um, Mr. White wants to take a, um, a stab at that question. It, uh, I know you're not a lawyer, but um, would there be any liability for uh, under the Disaster Risk Management Act? I think it's more in terms of the persons who are holding the event who would be liable under the da Disaster Risk Management Act rather than the person attending the event. Could you give us your... Thanks for... Um... Thanks for the, the precursor that I'm not a lawyer. So any response I give may not be based in law. However, uh, I believe the circumstances uh, may cause different situations to have different repercussions. Um, on the, in this particular situation, I'm, I'm not sure uh, that they're, they're um, I'm not sure what the, what the, um, what the law will, will hold, I believe that matter is actually still being contemplated. Um, and there are several um, areas of charge that have been laid against um, parties involved, uh, or rather um, principals involved at Rick's Cafe. Um, e essentially, what the Resilient Corridor provided for was for um, tourists that are uh, booked and staying within um, uh, hotels uh, to use other tourism um, um, entities that are COVID compliant certified um, that are also within the corridor um, and approved. Uh, whether or not the, 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 the event in question can be proven to be um, acting um, outside of the, the 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 law in relation to the DRMA and how it um, and how it intended uh, for those to be interpreted uh, in terms of events, I suspect will still be a subject mm -hmm. for for the lawyers and the courts to determine. Uh, but it, it's it's hard to give a very definitive um, answer to the question asked because the matter is still. Um, uh, subject of 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 of, um, of the legal um, minds and of the courts. Thank you. Yes, I think that that's uh, perhaps the fairest answer that we can give to that question at this time, since the matters are some of those matters are before the courts. Uh, Pro Professor Colilini, there's another question here from Craig Jacobs. Uh, the question is: Apart from the usual damages awarded in personal injury cases. Do successful claimants tend to recover damages for ruined holidays, emotional, psychological damage, and those peripheral heads of damage? I think the answer is in general, yes, depending, of course, on the circumstances. Once the damage is not too remote a consequence of the breach of duty, then the damages should be recoverable. Um, foreseeability, of course, is a, is a matter which is always um, important here. Was the particular loss foreseeable on the part of the defendant or not? Um, right. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the, normally one can recover not only for financial loss, but also for, um, what should we say, emotional um damage, disappointment, um, anything to do with the, any sort of um, psychological harm which is caused by the breach of duty will be recoverable as damage. Um, sometimes the damages could be aggravated, aggravated damages where the defendant, uh, the attitude of the defendant is particularly high-handed and particularly egregious, um, then a, um, aggravated damages can be awarded um, for the breach of duty. So it all depends on the circumstances. I think the answer is yes, in general, one can recover not only for financial loss, but also for emotional harm um, and other, other losses 
provided they are foreseeable on the part of the defendant. I think that's the best answer I can give to that. It all depends upon the circumstances and the court, you know, the, 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 depends on the view the court takes about the, you know, the, the, the um, degree of fault on the part of the defendant. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for Helen, there is a question. Uh, a visitor found a dead turtle on the beach by my parents. I am sure fishermen had caught it and took the meat out of it. The person said that it was cruel as the fisherman had clearly clogged the head of the turtle and uh, thought that I would like the shell. Clearly he does not know me. I was sure they were protecting or they were protected and therefore I had no intention of being in possession of the shell. Should it be uh, reported or is this strict liability? Uh, what is your answer to these questions? Um, so if you look at section 6A of the Wild, um, Wildlife Protection Act, it it's actually says anyone in possession of a protected or any part of a protected species is guilty of an offense. So strict liability, I would say report it to NEPO. I, I can't purport to know what NEPO will do, but I can't imagine in circumstances like that they'd prosecute for something like that. But I would say report it in terms of, so that maybe perhaps NEPO is keeping a database of, of, of these incidents you know, for later use. So you can try reporting it to see if they, they keep track of these things. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, someone else has said to the panel, all presenters have acknowledged that tourism is a major money earner for Jamaica and the Caribbean. However, the industry is famous for paying unattractive salaries to those very workers who contribute to the money earned. Is this a correct statement? I think perhaps we can put this to Carla and uh, Harris Roper to answer. Um, the, the truth be told is a lot of it will depend on the nature of the role that the person has. Um, so the vast majority of the workers are what we'd call the foot soldiers, um, those who are, you know, um, the, the servers, the housekeepers, the bartenders, um, and the nature of those roles, unfortunately, are not generally high paying roles. Truth be told, where there are unions and other representative bodies, there's a much greater and bigger lobby um, for better wages and attendant fringe benefits. Um, but, and, you know, persons who are in other roles like executive chefs, um, you know, people in different roles would, I think, have more market competitive rates. So, Whilst I don't think you'd find anybody generally who would say, oh, my, my, my salary, I'm happy with it. They'd always want more. The truth be told, a lot depends on the nature of the role, how it is that they are working, the nature of how they are engaged, and that impacts the salary. So I'm not saying no, but I'm not saying yes either. Okay. <laughs> I think it's all a matter of our relativity here. Yeah. Um, yes. Anybody else would like to jump in on that? Right. No one else. Um, seems to me that salaries generally are a question that um, need to be addressed. Uh, it's a question not only in that industry, I think uh, generally in the Caribbean and in um, you know, developing countries. So I don't think that question can be seen in isolation to the industry itself only. And so that's, that's something that I think we, we have to consider in the context of what others are being paid in other areas um, where there's a lot of unskilled labor. So I, I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on that. Um, 
we have another uh, question here for Professor Podilini. Uh, excellent presentation as usual. If a hotel guest is sexually assaulted by a hotel employee who accessed her room under the pretense of fixing something in her room and the hotel guest thereafter suffered emotional distress, pain and suffering because of the assault, how would the victim find the hotel liable? Would this be a claim in occupier's liability, negligence, a vicarious liability? And, you know, I would add perhaps also it could be criminal liability. But as far as you could see it as negligence, um, Professor, could you uh, respond? Yes, that's an excellent question. I, I think that um, the fact that the hotel employee had access to the room uh, means that the employee was employed to do that kind of work, the, 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 you know, to do maintenance work in the room, whatever it is. Um, yeah. It wasn't somebody who managed to get into the room by his own devious means. Somebody was actually enabled to get in the room as part of his employment. So you could say that the, the sexual assault was, was carried out in, in the course of his employment. And therefore, it'd be a clear case of uh, vicarious liability. Um, and um, the clearly, the um, emotional upset, um, emotional trauma caused to the claimant would be recoverable, um, probably quite extensive damages, quite a large, large amount of damages for that emotional um, trauma suffered by the claimant. Um, yeah, I think that would be a clear case of vicarious liability. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So if there are no other questions, uh, I don't see any other questions. Yes, there's one more, I think. Um, I think there's one other question. Professor Connellini, apart from the usual damages, uh, ruined holidays. I think that question was asked already. Sorry. All right. So if there are no um, other questions from the audience. Ms. Ms. Abrams, there's one more. I see it okay. says, if a family was visiting a hotel and alleged that the hotel was negligent in their duty of care, re COVID protocols, and caught COVID and unfortunately death resulted, could the hotel be held liable? Or could it be proved that the hotel's negligence caused the infection? Yes, that, yes. that, 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 that is, that is, that is um, a very um, pertinent question that has been asked. In fact, um, there's a gentleman in the United States called Stephen Bath, who has a regular column uh, online about you know, uh, recent developments in hospitality and tourism. And um, he was saying that um, so far there have been very few actual claims in the United States in relation to, uh, per, by, by persons who claim that they caught um, coronavirus by the negligence of a hotel. Um, so we don't really know what the how the courts will approach these issues. But what is clear is that causation is often a stumbling block for many claimants in tort, in, in, in tort and for negligence. You have to be able to prove that it was some breach of duty, for example, not enforcing protocols and so on and so forth, which actually caused the claimant to get the, uh, the, the, the disease, the COVID. Um, and that's extremely difficult to prove because you know COVID can be acquired from many different sources, not necessarily from any negligent act on the part of the, of the hotel. So uh, I think we'd have to wait and see whether the courts will accept um, or will rather impose liability in these circumstances. So, so far, apparently, there's been no um, indication that this will be a fertile source of damages to persons who unfortunately um, caught the, the COVID uh, virus. Mm -hmm. All right, and um, I would say perhaps that um, Mr. White, Donovan, if you could tell us 
has there been any such um, cases in Jamaica, as far as I know, that we have a very good record as far as COVID-19 and guests arriving at hotels. That's correct. And I spoke about it um, when, I, when I spoke in relation to the very low, I think it's, uh, it's just under 1% of all um, tests that have been taken uh, by guests leaving the country that have come back positive. Um, there is no, there's no evidence that any of those positive cases was caused or is caused by uh, negligence by, of, the, of the accommodation that they would have stayed. Uh, and you know we 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 very much pride ourselves on the on the strength and the the the, the details in the protocols that were developed um, when we restarted tourism in Jamaica. And so far, it has proven um, to serve us very well. Um, touch wood. Uh, we're going to continue to ensure that we manage, monitor, and maintain the level of diligence that we have put into. Um, destination assurance. We have a company that is responsible for our product assurance, which is um, Tourism Product Development Company. And they are the agency that goes to all of our tourism entities um, on a routine basis to examine the effective use of protocols, the application of the um, uh, mitigating um, steps that are put in place to ensure that visitors are safe, but more importantly, that our um, workers within the industry are safe because they are the ones that go back into our communities and could potentially be a source of spread. So uh, we've taken an extremely um, uh, broad view of how these protocols are designed and how they are applied. Um, so much so that we, prior to opening the industry, we had um, several um, uh, training sessions where uh, workers within the industry were brought in um, to the convention center and schooled, not just on the protocols, but how to apply them. And so we, 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 have, we, we believe we have found the, the formula there. Um, it's not just writing brilliant documents, it's also enabling the people who must execute those documents um, to understand them and to be able to apply them. Okay, so that on that very positive note, we're going to close this uh, brilliant discussion. Uh, this morning on tourism and the law. I thank all of my participants, all of my presenters. You've given excellent uh, presentations. Uh, if you were in person, we would have given you uh, a token of our appreciation, but now we're giving you a virtual token. We're saying thank you very much for attending. We appreciate mm -hmm. your time. I would also just like to plug the fact that we have developed a most recent uh, course. It's a certificate course in tourism and the law, and it's backed by the Ministry of Tourism. And uh, we did it last year. There is a certificate course for those who would like to uh, know more about the subject. And this year it's starting on July 7th to the 22nd, and you can sign up, just get in touch with us at the law faculty and we will give you all the information that you need. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, to come and to share your knowledge with us. We have been duly edified and we are very thankful to all of you. Have a great day. Thank you for giving us your Sunday. Blessings to everyone. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. The Faculty of Law celebrates its 50th anniversary this year. And what better way to celebrate than to launch a song competition that truly embodies and typifies the spirit of the Faculty of Law. This year, we had three entries. We are the light, cut above the rest, and one law. Each song will be played and the lyrics will be projected on the screen. Thereafter, a poll will be launched and participate. I three songs, and it was pick, pick which one, the best one. Vote on Saturday, you are not able to vote on Sunday. We ask that you cast your vote and help us decide the winning song to celebrate our 50th anniversary and to truly embody the spirit of the Faculty of Law. Thank you. Oh, the 
of law. You are the best faculty of law. Cut up of the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Law today, law tomorrow, law always. Law today, law tomorrow, law always. We are the light. The Faculty of Law celebrates its 50th anniversary this year, and what better way to celebrate than to launch a song competition that truly embodies and typifies the spirit of the Faculty of Law. This year, we had three entries, We Are the Light, Cut Above the Rest, and One Law. Each song will be played and the lyrics will be projected on the screen. Thereafter, a poll will be launched and participants will have the opportunity to vote only once. So we're asking if you vote on Saturday, you are not able to vote on Sunday. We ask that you cast your vote and help us decide the winning song to celebrate our 50th anniversary and to truly embody the spirit of the Faculty of Law. Thank you. What is going on?
Are the light.
take it to another level And we do things different now, hey Cause it's time to make a change In this world, yeah, we need some change Breathe, said it's time to breathe Gotta seize, gotta seize victory And dream, said we gotta take the lead And we gotta have to lead I'm so proud to be with you. Wish I could be.